Well, we seem to be recording, but for some reason, the microphone is not allowing me to reset the volume. Well, we'll just have to live with it. I'll talk. Uh, it may be that the volume is a little bit low today. I will try to talk a little bit louder than usual so that hopefully uh, we manage to uh, record uh, something useful. Um, okay, let me switch to the projector so that I'm seeing the same thing that you guys are seeing. Uh, I. Uh, uh, for our question of the day last time, we had a question about pineapple on pizza. Uh, I'm with the yeses. Um, at the very end of the last lecture, uh, I, I was uh, considering a question that I sometimes get uh, in response to that lecture. We were looking at these different kinds of shapes, and one of the things people notice is that there's a rectangle shape and a square. And people say, well, isn't a square a rectangle? It has an is a relationship. Shouldn't you use inheritance? So shouldn't square inherit from rectangle? And I was just kind of showing you at the, at the very end that I just Googled should square extend rectangle. And what you'll find is a whole bunch of pages where people are debating this specific issue that if you think of inheritance as an is a relationship, then yes, you could say that a square is a rectangle. But I had mentioned to you that there's a kind of a, a more um, strict uh, interpretation of it, which is that uh, uh, it can substitute for. Uh, th uh, there's a, a faculty member named Barbara Liskoff who is, uh, who's taught uh, at MIT. She's a Turing Award winner. And there's something that is named after her, the Liskoff Substitution Principle. And that says that uh, you know, that a square should extend rectangle only if a square is a reasonable substitute for a rectangle. And the argument is that rectangles can be stretched this way and this way, and uh, squares can only be uh, stretched uh, along one dimension, not along two, and so therefore squares should not extend rectangle. Uh, I'm in the Liskoff camp, and that's why I did not have that inheritance relationship. But I, you know, I just thought you might find it interesting that these kinds of things get debated within the object-oriented programming community. Okay, uh, I'm going to be talking about your homework assignment today. So I think that what I'll go ahead and do then is uh, switch to the overhead camera. Let's hope that that is working for us. Let me be looking at the same thing that you're looking at. So this next homework assignment, uh, the topic of the assignment is compression. And this is your last homework assignment for the quarter. It is a 30-point assignment. Uh, it is due Friday of next week, so kind of the last day of class, Friday of next week. And you can turn it in up to two days late. So normally we've allowed you to turn it in up until the Monday after. This time it's Sunday, so you have, you have the weekend after to complete it, but then there's an absolute cutoff. So be very careful uh, to pay attention to that. Uh, you have until that Sunday uh, uh, as the last chance to turn in homework eight. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, uh, talking about homework eight today. Uh, we have a, um, a holiday coming up next Monday. Uh, on the Monday, though, I, I'm going to uh, release the final exam materials. And uh, a week from Friday, on the last day, I'm going to be talking about the final, do a kind of a review for the final uh, on that day. OK, so compression. Uh, basically, uh, this involves trying to understand how things are stored, say, on a computer. And I've mentioned the idea that we don't talk a lot about binary. Uh, we used to talk about it a lot more in the olden days. So we might have mentioned ideas like, suppose that you had three binary bits available to you. Uh, it, suppose you were going to have a code or something. H how many different uh, things could you encode if you had three bits available to you? Well, this can be a zero or a one. This can be a zero or a one. This can be a zero or a one. So there's three different bits with two possibilities each. There would be two cubed or 
eight possible sequences that you could store if you had three bits available to you. So, you know, there's kind of theory of, of, uh, of uh, codes and sequences. I think that uh, most of you are familiar with the, with the notion of a byte, that uh, once we started uh, dealing with binary representations of things, we decided we didn't want to do things like this where you have just three bits available to you. You know, that we wanted to say that uh, you would get byte-sized things. Uh, a byte is eight bits. So that, you know, if you're going to be storing something uh, on a, in a computer's memory or on an external device or something, that we want to tend to have the bits in multiples of eight. So you can have one byte, two bytes, three bytes, uh, and so forth. So that's going to be some terminology that will be relevant to, to what we're going to talk about. I thought I'd mention that, you know, so, the, you know, the, a lot of what we're uh, trying to understand here is codes, how to encode things uh, when you store them. Um, I think it's worth mentioning a little bit of history here. So uh, the, it's funny, the U.S. Constitution uh, uh, comes into play here because there's a, a, a clause in the Constitution that says that every 10 years the country will do a census to figure out how many people there are. We just completed the 2020 census and they announced that they're rearranging how many members of Congress different states get uh, based on that census. Well, uh, in, uh, in 1880, the census that was done for 1880 took eight years to complete. You know, it was taking longer and longer to complete the census. And they were worried that the 1890 census was not going to be something they could complete in 10 years, that they were going to get behind and then kind of find that they, they, they could never catch up. Uh, because it was taking too long to, to compute the census. So they had a contest uh, for who could come up with a, a scheme for doing this better. And there was a fellow named Hollerith uh, who came up with a scheme that involved working with punched cards. So this was kind of some early uh, information processing, I guess you could say, you could describe it as. It, it wasn't a computer, but it used cards as a way of storing information. Uh, in fact, so Hollerith is an interesting figure. I think he never quite uh, made much money because I think he had a company that, that had basically this one customer, the census, you know, but uh, Hollerith's company was eventually uh, merged with a company that you might have heard of called IBM. Uh, and IBM certainly became a very large company. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but IBM is not just a computer company. Uh, long before IBM was working with computers, they had machines that would manipulate these Hollerith cards, uh, card sorting machines, for example, uh, that would do some specific task but weren't general purpose computers. Uh, in fact, these, these cards kind of survived a long time. Uh, when I was a freshman, uh, I used to have to put, use punched cards as the way to enter my programs into a computer to be executed. So, you know, I like a lot of freshmen at my school, I used to walk around with this box of punched cards that had my various programs in them. So uh, <laughs> within my lifetime, at least, you know, this is not something that's, that's all that, that old, the idea of these IBM punched cards. Well, when computers started becoming popular in the late 50s and early 60s, you know, people, uh, a lot of people were using the IBM uh, way of encoding things. They, they had a system known as EBCDIC that went along with these Hollerith cards. But, I, you know, people kind of realized there are things they didn't like about EBCDIC, not least of which the fact that it was associated with a company. Uh, so there was a committee formed, and they came up with something known as ASCII. So, uh, and I normally ask, does anybody know what ASCII stands for? And I'm always pleasantly surprised that there are people in the audience who know. It is the American Standard Standard Code for, there's kind of a word for that didn't make it into the acronym, but for information interchange. Uh, that's what ASCII stands for. So this committee kind of came up with uh, a, a, a set of codes. The, uh, the ASCII code is a seven-bit code. Uh, so how many different sequences? Well, it's like what we had here that, you know, you can do two to the seventh different characters, and people who know their powers of two know that that's 128. 
So ASCII has 128 characters uh, that, that are part of the ASCII code. Uh, and uh, uh, ASCII was very, uh, very popular, used a lot. Uh, uh, it's still, uh, we'll see, uh, it's still used in a sense uh, even today. Well, since it was a seven bit code and we tend to get things in eight bit bytes, there was kind of this option of having an eight bit and there were different things people did with ASCII for that eight bit. So some people did an extended version of ASCII that had extra characters. Uh, more often what people did is they, they uh, introduced what's known as a parity bit that, um, you know, that uh, especially uh, back then, but even, even now, you know, when you're transmitting information uh, over an unreliable line, potentially, a network connection or in, the, in those days a phone connection with a, with a modem, you know, that often there might be static on the line or something that your characters would not be properly uh, understood. They wouldn't be transmitted properly across the line. So what you can do with a parity bit is that you apply some function to your seven bits and you have that produce a zero or a one, depending upon what the seven bits are. And so uh, if, you, if you have some kind of random sequence of bits, there's only a 50-50 chance that you'll come up with the correct parity bit. So uh, what you can do is by, by uh, adding a parity bit to each of, these, uh, each of these characters, it's a way of being able to de detect errors, you know, that, you're, that there's noise on the line or something. And so you could warn somebody uh, that, uh, that there's damage uh, to these characters. So anyway, that was kind of uh, what we did uh, in the early days. And I, I usually ask the class for, you know, what's wrong with ASCII and I get lots of uh, different suggestions. I mean, one of the kind of obvious things is what about foreign character sets? You know, there's a lot of Chinese characters, there's a lot of Japanese characters, you know, uh, so, uh, but you don't even have to, deal with that. I think, you know, the fact that it's American was kind of, you know, I think the, one of the biggest problems with ASCII. Uh, so, I mean, if you think, for example, about uh, the Brits, I mean, we're very friendly uh, with England. Uh, they, uh, the, they use pounds, you know, for their currency. We use dollars. ASCII includes a dollar sign. It doesn't include the pound uh, character. So, you know, the, the, even the Brits, you know, they can't use ASCII. And a lot of Europeans would find that, you know, German uh, has some special umlaut characters. You know, there's special accent characters in French and other languages. Spanish has an enye character. So uh, even, even uh, things that are close to uh, uh, ASCII uh, are, are not supported. You know, some people tried to include characters like that in an extended ASCII, but it never quite became popular. So anyway, we need something much bigger than this in order to accommodate uh, the range of characters that you'd really want to, to have. Uh, the modern version of this is that we use something known as Unicode. And there's a standards committee, an international standards committee that decides what to include with Unicode and then kind of what characters uh, to do for that. Uh, there's different schemes that they, that they uh, uh, will put out. Probably the most popular, uh, most commonly used code is something known as UTF-8. Uh, that's probably the most common code that's used uh, in the world. Um, UTF-8 is a code that has some characters that are one byte long, some characters that are two bytes long, and some characters that are four bytes long. So, you know, the four bytes gives you lots of room to have some variety in there. So it's a variable length code. Some things are, are, are just the one byte long, some up to four bytes long. And one of the things they decided to do for UTF-8 is that they would include ASCII as part of the code. So the one byte codes in UTF-8 are the ASCII characters, the ASCII code. So that's kind of preserved. The ASCII characters uh, are there. Um, uh, they, they use the eighth bit, a setting in the eighth bit, bit to kind of indicate whether it's a one byte uh, character or whether it's got more than one byte to it. 
So uh, the ones that are one byte are all of the standard ASCII characters. The ASCII characters, you know, include all of the normal American English uh, characters, including upper and lower case letters, dollar signs, and some special characters like control characters, the escape character, backspace, delete, you know, so it includes uh, a lot of different things there, just not kind of the things that are non-American, uh, are not part of ASCII. Um, for our purposes, I think that it's not a bad idea for you to just imagine that you're working entirely with ASCII codes. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to treat things one byte at a time. We're not going to try to recognize two byte codes or four byte codes. We're going to deal with things that are, you know, one byte at a time. So if we came across a four byte code, for example, we would just think of that as if it were four characters. So uh, we're, we're going to be uh, kind of living in a simpler universe, thinking of it in a simpler way, uh, that as if it, these were all ASCII characters. Well, and many of them will be ASCII characters. Uh, a lot of text files are stored uh, mostly in that form. If they don't have any of these special characters that require two or four bytes, uh, then uh, the, the file will be stored uh, in, in an ASCII way. All right, well, that's kind of a, a little bit of history that uh, I don't know whether some of that was interesting or not. Uh, but then there's kind of this idea of how would we compress a file. So what if we had a big text file? So uh, we've seen examples of this, like Moby Dick, for example, you know, the, the novel. Uh, we've seen uh, that had uh, over 200,000 words, you know, that were part of Moby Dick. What would, you know, I, I, I usually ask people to think about what could you do to try to store it in a more compact way? And I get lots of interesting suggestions. One of the things that people tend to focus on is words. Uh, you may remember that Moby Dick had over 200,000 words, but there were only 30,000 unique words. So, you know, maybe you could come up with 30,000 codes for the words, and that could be shorter somehow. Um, there's kind of the question of what constitutes a word. I mean, in that, in that program, we use spaces and tabs. You know, we use white space as a way to break things up into words. But you could imagine a text file that doesn't have any spaces in it. You know, and then what if we were going to try to compress that by breaking it up into words, and we don't see any words. I mean, maybe it's all data, and there's, there's you know, no spaces at all anywhere in some long sequence of characters. So uh, it's, it's a challenge to kind of think of how you can do this well. Um, usually I get somebody who will, who will point out that, uh, well, uh, can we somehow take advantage of frequency of, of things in the file? Frequency of different characters, for example. And uh, people are, are almost always kind of focused on words or sequences of characters and collapsing them. And that can be helpful. You know, kind of the, the best compression algorithms do deal with sequences of characters, not just individual characters. But the, we're going to look at kind of a, you know, a, a simpler idea that actually does a pretty good job considering how, how simple the idea is, that we're going to deal with, with individual characters. Uh, but we are going to try to take advantage of the frequency of those characters. So uh, for the ASCII codes, you know, one of the things that's true of these different characters is that they're all this, you know, seven bits long, eight if you include the, the UTF-8, you know, bit that tells you that it's an ASCII character. So they're all exactly the same length, you know, so kind of we, if we... Uh, 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 they'd all cut off in exactly the same way. They're, say, you know, seven or eight, eight bits long. The, the idea that we're going to apply is, what if we allowed the, the codes to be of variable length? So what if we could have a very short code, for example, for a letter like E that might occur frequently uh, in English text? Or another thing, that, you know, in a file like Moby Dick, there's a lot of spaces in the file, you know, so maybe we could have a very short code that we would use for uh, a, a character like a space, and then maybe we could have a really long code for a character like a Q that doesn't occur very often, or a tilde. How many tildes are there in the file? So, you know, what if, you know, what if there's only a few of these? So then we wouldn't mind having a really long code.
code for that because it has such a low frequency to it. Uh, that's the idea that we want to take advantage of. And we're going to use a particular technique uh, that was um, uh, invented by a fellow named Huffman. So uh, what we're looking at here is something known as a Huffman code. We are going to make a tree that kind of gives us the code, and uh, we refer to those as Huffman trees. All right. Uh, I, uh, I have an example. So in the assignment write-up, when you go to take a look at this, you'll see that I work through an, a, a detailed example where I say, suppose that I had uh, uh, one occurrence of a C and so forth. So I kind of show you different characters and their frequencies. And I show you a sequence of steps that you go through to kind of turn that into, uh, into a tree. So uh, it's nice that you have that example available to you in the assignment write-up. I want to give you an extra example to work with. Let me make sure I'm giving you the right frequencies here for what I intended. So uh, what if you had a file that had four occurrences of the letter A, two occurrences of the letter B, six occurrences of the letter C, five occurrences of the letter D, eight occurrences of the letter E, and one occurrence of the letter F. But it's a ridiculous file. <laughs> Who would have a file that has this set of frequencies? Uh, so, I mean, any real file is going to have very different kinds of frequencies that you would find in the file. But uh, this makes for a nice little test case, a nice little simple example to talk about. So what do we do? So we're going to build up a tree. What we do initially is for all of the characters that occur in the file, we're going to make a leaf node for that character. And we want to put these things into order by frequency. We mentioned that the frequency matters. So of these different characters, F has the lowest frequency. So I'm going to introduce a leaf node here for the character F with a frequency of 1. Uh, and then the next most frequent character is a B with a frequency of 2. So we'll have a B with a frequency of 2. Then we get to an A with a frequency of 4. Uh, and then what do we have next? A D with a frequency of 5. And then we have a C with a frequency of 6. And we have uh, an E with a frequency of 8. So we had six characters, so we end up with six leaf nodes. You're going to be working with a structure that's known as a priority queue, priority queue. Uh, so this is a, a particular kind of data structure. Um, I am not going to talk to you about how priority queues are implemented. Uh, I mean, one of the themes that we've had for this course is that uh, sometimes you're a client of a class. And I think it's actually a feature, not a bug, that you uh, will have the experience of working with a data structure where you don't know what's inside it. You don't know how it's implemented. You just know what it does. You kind of have the, have the client view of it. So for a priority queue, a priority queue uh, keeps track of things in order, you know, in a kind of sorted order. So when you go to remove something from a priority queue, it removes the smallest thing in the queue. And you can add things back in. Uh, so uh, we're going to use this structure as the thing that's going to that's help us to build up our Huffman tree. And what you do over and over again in building up the tree is you remove the two smallest things from the tree. So you do kind of, I mean, from, from the priority queue. So you do two remove commands. And you recombine those two things under a new node uh, and then put that node back into the structure. So it's the F and the B that are, have the smallest frequency. So they have a combined frequency of 3 uh, when we add the 1 and the 2. So we, we uh, would uh, remove these two items. Well, and actually, I, sh I should have done this while I still had just this. I, I mentioned that, that there's six leaf nodes. So there's six things in our priority queue. And in a sense, you could think of it as that there's six trees all very simple trees. They're all just leaf nodes. What we do here is we remove two, uh, put them under a node, and then put this back into the structure. 
so that now the structure has one, two, three, four, five things. It's gone from six things to five things because we take out two, uh, recombine them, and then put that back. So taking out two, putting one back, there's a kind of a net reduction of one thing, you know, from the queue. And three, uh, even with the, the nodes combined, three is smaller than the four, so this is still kind of in the correct order. So the next step we would follow, uh, oh, well, actually, uh, yeah, well, let me do that, and then I'll, I wanted to make a comment about this. The next step we would follow then is that we'd remove the, the, the node that has the three, and we'd remove this node that has a four, and we would combine them under a brand new node that has a, f a combined frequency of the three and the four, which is a seven. So this would be, uh, which would go here, and this would go here. Now, one of the things that you can kind of see, uh, even with just uh, the amount that we've built up here, is that the Huffman tree is not unique. You know, so this algorithm involves uh, combining uh, different uh, nodes to, to, uh, to form uh, a tree, you know, with branches and so forth. But consider, for example, what if I switch the order of these two leaves? Then I'd have a tree that has a different structure, and having a different structure would mean that it would produce different codes, but it would be just as effective as a, as a uh, Huffman tree. It would, it would have the, the same ability to compress a file, uh, and it would have codes of the same length uh, as the tree that we have here. So uh, in a sense, there's more than one possible right answer, you know, for building up a Huffman tree in this way. Uh, but we want to keep things simple. So we, we want to have it be the case that you produce exactly the same tree that we produce. So one of the things that we'll uh, uh, do, that, that you'll find about the assignment write-up is that there's some very particular instructions, you know, that it, it tells you very, very specific things. One of the things it mentions, for example, is that when you do this process of removing two things and combining them to make a new node, the first item removed becomes the left-hand subtree. The second item removed becomes the right-hand subtree. So we're very specific that we want this version of the tree with F to the left and B to the right. So there's a lot of those little things that you'll want to be on the lookout for. If you have a tree that seems to be producing codes of the same length and you know, the, uh, and it seems to compress as much as the, as the, as the, uh, the one that we're providing, but it's not exactly the same, you've probably missed one of these uh, little specifications, one of these little details that we mentioned. Because if you follow the spec, you should get exactly the same tree that we get. You might wonder what happens uh, with the priority queue if there's a tie, how does it break ties? And that will matter but if you're using the priority queue from Java and we're using the priority queue from Java, we will, you know, it'll break the ties in exactly the same way. So it always breaks the ties in a predictable way. You don't have to know how it, how it breaks the ties. You, we just need to know that you're using the same structure that we're using so that ties will be broken uh, in the same way. All right, well now this tree is kind of screwed up because you know what I would do is I would uh, you know I, I would recombine this as a node that has the seven and put it back into the structure, which means now the priority queue has one, two, three, four things that it's keeping track of. Well, uh, let me rearrange this so that they're in their proper order. So what do we have? We have a leaf node B that has a frequency of five. Uh, actually, let me. Let me give myself a little more room than that. I'm going to move it down the page a little bit. B with a frequency of 5. Then we have C with a frequency of 6. And then we have a node that has a frequency of 7. And it has uh, off to the right uh, a leaf node uh, that has A with a frequency of 4. And off to the left... It has a node that has a frequency of three, and what it has is off to the left, there's a leaf node uh, that's for F with a frequency of one, and another leaf node for B with a frequency of two. Uh, so that was our five, six, seven. Then we have E with a frequency of eight. 
would be over here, E with a frequency of 8. Okay, so that's, that's where I'm at at this point. I've got now four things that I'm working with. So what I would do is I would remove the two smallest, recombine them under a new node, so this would have a frequency of 11, and we would you know, kind of combine those two, and then put it back into the structure. Now, when it goes back into the structure, it's in the wrong order, because 11 is bigger than 7 and 8, but I don't want to have to keep redrawing everything, so I'm going to ask you to kind of just bear with me a minute and not worry about it. Understand that this would be at the end, so that these two would be the smallest ones now. So these two would be combined into a node that has a combined frequency of 15, and then that would be put back into the priority queue. Uh, and now they're in the right order, right? 11 is smaller than 15, so then we would remove these two and combine them under a new node that would have a combined frequency of 26, and put that back into the priority queue. And now we've reached a point where we have just one tree. The priority queue is down to one thing, and so we're done. So uh, we've, we've made our Huffman tree. This is the main thing that you're going to be doing in the first part of the homework. It's a 30-point homework, as I mentioned, but it is divided into two parts to make that a little bit easier. So in the first part, you're doing this work of building up a Huffman tree. Now, uh, how do you turn the tree into a set of codes? Well, uh, so what were our characters? A, B, C, D, E, and F were our different, our different uh, 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 characters here that were from our file. So uh, the convention that we're going to follow here is that we're going to consider left links to be zeros. So it's as if you know, every left branch you know, had a, had a zero associated with it, and all of the right branches are going to be thought of as a one. And what we want to do to record the code for a character is to see what path you follow in going from the root to that character. So the A is here. What path would you follow in going from the root to the A? Well, you'd have to go right, and then left, and then right which would be 1, 0, 1, in order to get to the A. 1, 0, 1 is the path that would get us from, an a, from the root to an A. To get to a B, we would have to do 1, 0, 0, 1 to get to a B. 1, 0, 0, 1 to get to a B. How about C? So normally I, I wait for someone in the class to tell me the C is over here. So what's the path that gets you to a C? It's 0, 1. That's what the code we would use for a C. How about a D? A D is over here. It's 0, 0 would be the code for D. E is over here, and its code then would be 1, 1. Uh, and F is way down here. The code would be 1, 0, 0, 0. 1, 0, 0, 0. So those would be the codes that we would come up with. And in part one, it tells you kind of the output that we want for this, that we're going to want you to print out the, uh, the integer th that this corresponds to, the, the ASCII code that this would correspond to uh, on one line and the code on a separate line. So you'd say for the character with this particular ASCII value, uh, here's the code that it should have. So uh, that's kind of part one, is uh, uh, coming up with the tree uh, and printing it out. Um, one of the things that's worth mentioning about that for part one is you're going to be putting these things into a priority queue and using the priority queue to build this up. So the priority queue needs to have a way to compare these things, to know which ones are smaller. And you're going to use the frequency to do that, but but uh, how is the priority queue going to tap into that? We don't want the priority queue to, to know anything about the nodes or about frequencies and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to have it implement the comparable interface. Your node class will implement the comparable interface. And that's how the priority queue is going to be able to tell which nodes come before other nodes. Uh, so that's, gonna, that's where this discussion we've been having about, uh, about comparable is going to come into play, uh, is that you're going to have your node class implement comparable. All right, well then, uh, 
you know, if you'd come up with a set of codes like this and you had an input that looked like C, A, B, how would you encode that? Well, the code for C is a zero, 01, the code for an A is 101, and the code for a B is 1001. So this would be the sequence of zeros and ones that we would use to encode C, A, B. And there's an encoding program that would do this thing for you. It'll kind of turn this into a sequence of zeros and ones like this. And when I have a, a live audience, I usually pause and ask people, is there anything odd about that or anything uh, that, uh, that seems uh, uh, significant that we need to be thinking about? And uh, you know, I, I, I tried to prompt this on purpose by underlining this, underlining this, underlining this. Don't you need to know those breaks? Don't you need to know where this character code ends and where this character code ends? And this one, I mean, it's not like what we had way back here where all the character codes are exactly the same length. You know, then you'd know what the breaks are because they're all of the same length. But when it's a variable length code like this, don't you need the underline, you know, to kind of know? So don't you need something extra that would help you to keep track of that? And the answer is no, you don't need something extra. And it's because the uh, Huffman tree has a clever property to it, something that's known as the prefix property. This is a property that any code can have, so it's not unique to uh, Huffman codes, but some codes have this property, some do not. Morse code does not have this property, uh, but uh, Huffman codes do have this property. The prefix property says that there is no code that is the prefix of some other code. So for example, notice that D's code is zero, zero. That means that there's no other code that can begin with zero, zero. So you know, this, this can't be the prefix, the beginning part of a second code. Because then if you saw a zero, zero, you wouldn't know whether to consider it a D or whether to keep going and consider the things that came after the zero, zero. So the prefix property says that this will never be ambiguous that there's no code that is the prefix of another code. Well, why is that true? Uh, if we think about this character D, for example, so we know that the code for D was zero, zero. What would it mean if there was some other character that be, whose code began with zero, zero? That would mean that there are other things underneath D, that D would branch and there would be other nodes under here that would lead to some other character. But remember, the way that we started this whole process is we started with a leaf node for each character that we're encoding. So D was a leaf node on purpose. All of these things are leaf nodes and that's why we satisfy the prefix property. That's why none of the codes that are developed would lead to the code for another one because all, all of our characters to be encoded are stored in leaves. So the, the, the thing that we would do is if we had a sequence like this, when we go to do the decoding, and that's the second part of your assignment, is to kind of write code that, uh, that uh, uh, allows for this decoding. You always start at the top of the tree, and if we see zero, 01, you would see zero, 01, and you'd say, ah, I hit a leaf, let me write out a C, you know, and then go back to the top of the tree. And after the zero, 01, there's a 101, one. ah, I hit a leaf again, let me write out an A and go back to the top of the tree, and then I see a 1001, 1001. Oh, I hit a leaf node again. I'll write out a B and go back to the top of the tree. So the decoding kind of involves starting at the top of the tree, descending until you hit a leaf node, and then that's a character to be, to be printed. Back to the top of the tree, descend until you hit a leaf, and then that's another character to be output back to the top of the tree, descend until you hit a leaf, that's another character to be output. So that's what you're gonna work on in the second part of the assignment, including reconstructing your tree from the output that you produced you know, in part one. So that's kind of be kind of the, the second thing that you're gonna work on. All right, uh, there are a few more things that I wanted to mention. One of them is 
you know, suppose that you were doing the encoding part. So if you knew that you wanted to, you know, to uh, output a zero one as a code, if you did a, a, a print command, the way we've been using print commands, then you'd be printing out an ASCII character for a zero and an ASCII character for a one when you go to print these things, and that would take up eight bits of output. So that means each zero and one would take up eight bits of space on the computer. Now Huffman on a good day tends to give you maybe 50% you know, reduction, so it cuts it in half. If you're, if you're storing each, each bit in an eight bit you know, space, then, you, then that takes eight times you know, as much space as the underlying bits. So cut in half times the eight, your compression that's supposed to make a smaller file would end up with something that's four times as big as the original. You know, and four times the original size is not going to be very impressive compression. So uh, what you'll find in the assignment write-up is that I have developed two different classes for you to use called bit output stream and bit input stream. And they're used to uh, store bits in a compact form so that we, you know, that we, we don't have this problem of, of uh, making things uh, eight bits long. So you're going to use bit input stream and bit output stream. That does lead to a certain limitation. So suppose, for example, that when you go to print out your whole sequence of zeros and ones, that you end up with 803 bits that you output. Well, my bit output stream uh, is byte oriented in that you can only get multiples of eight. So you can have 800 bits, but if you needed 803, then I'll give you 808 bits. But 803 is not an option that I support. So my, my output is going to be 808 bits long. And so what's that going to do? That means you'll output 803 bits, and suppose those extra five bits were just zeros. You know, there's kind of five extra zeros at the end that weren't part of the output that you produced. What would your program do? Well, it would see a zero, zero, and it would print out a D, it would be a, see another zero, zero, and print out another D. It would see a fifth zero, and then it runs out of bits. You know, that might confuse your program, but assuming your program finished, I mean, it would have two extra characters at the end, two extra D characters. And you might say, well, yeah, that's just what my program does. It doesn't actually reproduce the original exactly. That would be unacceptable. You know, you can't do that. It has to actually reproduce the original. It would be nice if there was an end of file character that everyone agreed on that files always end with this special character. There is no such character, but we kind of pretend that there's one. So you'll read about the fact that we have the idea of a pseudo EOF character. We're gonna invent a character that doesn't actually exist. And we're gonna end our files with the pseudo EOF character. So that as you're going through this process, you're gonna stop once you hit the pseudo EOF character. It's gonna tell you to stop, to stop going. So it's a made up character where there's one of them at the end of the file, which means it has a frequency of one. So you're gonna add it to, you, to the original tree, you know, the original uh, uh, priority queue uh, with a frequency of one. This is all described in the assignment write up. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I, I, uh, you'll be able to see it there. Um, I want to use the last few minutes to switch back to the Macintosh so that I can show you some of this. So um, I've got, uh, I've opened up a little uh, uh, terminal window here on my Mac. I, I've mentioned that this is basically a, a Unix shell that I have available here. Um, in Unix, there's a command ls and uh, with an option minus l that lets me find out about files. So I've asked it, tell me about files uh, that uh, begin with Hamlet. And it's showing me that there's a file called hamlet.txt that's 196,197 bytes long. That's how many characters it has. If I take a look at hamlet.txt, you know, it's this text of Hamlet, the play Hamlet. Well, let me show you what happens when I run the, the, the there, there are various programs I've written for you. So uh, if I compile and run my make code program, I tell it to look at huffman.txt, and then 
I had to come up with extensions to use for these different uh, file names. And this is the, the last page of the assignment write-up. It mentions to you the conventions that I've come up with. So TXT, that's a standard convention for text files. But uh, I've, I, I came up with the idea that we would use .code as the extension for a file that, uh, that contains the code information. So I'm going to say Huffman.code. That's just a made-up convention that I've decided to call it Huffman.code. What did I do incorrectly here? Let's try this again. Uh, let me run the program uh, hamlet.txt, and let me do hamlet. Oh, uh, I think I'm running the wrong program here. Let me go ahead and uh, end this. Uh, we've got make code. Let me compile and run my make code. So the input file name is hamlet.txt, and the code file that I want to generate is hamlet.code. So that worked. Uh, and if I come back over here and take a look, remember there was that ls command that I can kind of see what's going on here. So there's a brand new file called hamlet.code that's 964 characters long. And I can take a look at what's in hamlet.code. And it's a sequence of uh, uh, ASCII codes with, a, with a, a sequence of zeros and ones to use for encoding it. So the character with ASCII value 97 should be encoded as 0001 is kind of what it's showing you there. Once you've made a code, you'd be able to run my encode program. So let's go ahead and do that. And so we would say hamlet.txt and hamlet.code. Now the output file name, this is the compressed file. I thought about calling it hamlet.zip, you know, but I don't want to confuse your computer. So I decided that those would be called .short. So that's the convention that I'm following for that. And if I take a look, there's now a thing called hamlet.short. The compressed file is 109,000 bytes long. Not quite a 50% reduction, but a pretty good reduction. Um, if I try to take a look at hamlet.short, I get a warning from the Mac. This doesn't look like a text file. Are you sure? And if I say yes, ah, what's that? Well, I mean, we made up the codes here. This is not a text file. These aren't ASCII codes that are used here. What it's displaying for me here is, is what this file would store if it were done in ASCII. If these really were ASCII codes, this is what would be in the file. That's not what's in the file. It's a binary file. So, you know, it was kind of smart enough to let me know these are not files that we're going to be able to read with something like a text editor or something. What we would need to be able to do is something like running the decode program where we say take that hamlet.short, that compressed file, and hamlet.code and use it to make, I'm going to call this hamlet.new. Uh, and so it's reconstituting the file. And if I come back here, there's now something called hamlet.new, which is 196,197 bytes long, just like the original. Uh, and if I, uh, there's a command diff where I could diff hamlet.txt and hamlet.new and diff doesn't show any differences. That, that's what the output comparison tool does. All right, I want to show you one last thing that I think I might have enough time for. Let me do a new uh, file here. Um, uh, a plain text file. So, uh, the, uh, the, the problem that we worked on before, uh, let me bring back my character frequencies. I had told you that I wanted to have a file that had four occurrences of a capital A, two capital Bs, one, two, three, four, five, six Cs, one, two, three, four, five Ds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Es, and an F. Uh, I'm going to save this file. Uh, in my Huffman folder is something called test.txt. So you can make files like this, like a test.txt, and then you can come over here and say, let me go ahead and run this program, uh, and let me use test.txt, and let's uh, have it uh, output to test.code. So I can make a code file from test.txt, test.code, and it's, uh, oh, I wanted to go into my Huffman folder 
and do test.code. And it's showing me, for example, that a capital A that has ASCII code 65 should have a code of 101, which is just what we ended up with on the pad of paper. All of those codes we came up with is exactly what we have here. Now, I didn't put an F in the file because this is the version that's using a pseudo ELAF. So the F 